So the next speaker is uh, Dr. Boli. Uh, so uh, who just joined the, the, the session, so uh, the live, I mean. Um, uh, so Dr. Boli is an assistant professor uh, with uh, a really uh, uh, interesting background, uh, uh, rather physics and bioinformatics background at the University of Texas. So the Southern Medical Center. And he is mainly interested in developing uh, novel bioinformatics methods to investigate high throughput uh, genomics data and understand um, disease etiology and uh, biological processes. He has a particular interest in cancer. So today is going to introduce his new uh, computational methods uh, that allows to recover TCR sequences uh, from bulk RNA sequencing data uh, that he got from T TCGA and try to predict uh, cancer associated TCRs. So Dr. Boli, uh, stage is for you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, let me share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay. Um, so we can see the arrows. Okay, perfect. That's great. Now the pointer should be at the left corner down. If you go down. Left. Sorry, I'm using Keynote. Ah, okay, so then, <laughs> okay, that's perfect. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I would like to thank the organizers of the AIR conference for giving me this great opportunity. Um, and uh, thank you all for uh, holding this great tradition, even in this very difficult year. Um, so today I'm uh, going to talk a little bit about our uh, recent research on the detection of cancer cell uh, cancer from the peripheral blood TCR repertoire. So this is um, um, uh, this work was actually motivated by the the success of uh, cancer immunotherapies, um, as uh, one of the uh, contributors, Dr. Corina, has uh, greatly introduced her work in the uh, 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 vaccine, new antigen and DC vaccine. Um, um, of course, we are also interested in this um, uh, fascinating topic, um, and uh, we are interested in looking at the tumor infiltrating T cells, which are the key components in, uh, in most of the immunotherapies because they can selectively kill the cancer, the cancer cells. Um, of course, this is almost the paradigm for many um, uh, in vivo studies that are, that are investigating the drugs uh, uh, for a chipon blockade uh, or other reagents that can boost the immune system that you usually observe um, a total decrease of the tumor volume. And that's why you feel comfortable to apply that drug to the clinic. Uh, and what is really amazing about the immunotherapy is that it's different from the traditional therapy in that the response rate, I mean, at the beginning was not very high. Uh, maybe for the melanoma cohort, there's only like 15% of response rate, but you really see a sustained response. So it seems that the, the immune cells that are being boosted uh, by the immunotherapies, they're really generating a long-term memory response to protect the cancer patients. So that is one of the amazing um, findings. Um, but uh, the limitation of the current practice uh, for a single reagent cancer immunotherapies is their low, relatively low response rate. Uh, and even with, rec uh, with uh, many uh, combination partners for uh, checkpoint blockaders, the, the response will be like, increased a little bit. Now it's much better. I think some, some, ther some combination can even increase to 100%, such as new antigen vaccine combined with, um, uh, with the checkpoint blockade. Um, but a lot of questions remains unknown about the tumor infiltrating T cells and how and uh, how do they recognize the new antigens. So our primary interest is to uh, characterize the interaction between the tumor infiltrating T cell receptors um, and their um, uh, antigen uh, peptide amicacy complex. So for the audience of this conference, I don't think I need to introduce the, the molecular interaction between TCR and amicacy class one. Um, the diversity of the CDR3 region is well, is well acknowledged. Um, but for the, for the tumor antigens, um, I think like Dr. Corino has just mentioned, uh, tumor neoantigen is a significant amount of the um, immunogenicity part of the uh, tumor antigen pool. But there are also many other categories of tumor antigens, which all adds to the diversity of um, 
of the unknown tumor antigens. So for example, DNA alterations is like one source that can generate somatic mutations or frame shift indels. Or, um, but there are also uh, mutations that are caused by uh, abnormal uh, transcriptome regulations, such as tissue residual gene expression or de novo open reading frames, or even um, uh, abnormal mod modification of the proteins. So uh, there's a really uh, a large diversity that can be uh, generated for the tumor antigens. And considering the, the even more diverse CDR3s, um, it, is, it is really challenging to find which TCRs can recognize what kind of cancer antigens. And this become increasingly more challenging if you look at the uh, MGC class one, um, different MGC class one alleles. So this is an extremely difficult problem. So we are interested in solving this problem from a different angle, which is uh, motivated by the recent uh, work by um, uh, Mark Davis and Paul uh, Thomas. So we want to cluster TCRs into antigen specific groups. Um, and um, with that, we actually uh, identified a novel cancer associated antigen. This is not new antigen uh, because TCR clusters, uh, you, re you really, it's difficult to find novel new antigens, but we can find the novel cancer associated antigens. And finally, we want to uh, convince the audience that uh, the TCRs we find here are indeed cancer associated and uh, we can train a new machine learning method to uh, identify the, uh, to, to the novel prediction of such T cells. So uh, as I said, this work was motivated by Dr. Mark Davis uh, and uh, Dr. Paul Thomas, their nature papers in, uh, published in 2017, where they, they actually, uh, they introduced the new clustering methods. So this one is Glyph for um, clustering the similar TCRs into um, antigen specific groups. So the, the, I think one of the most important uh, message delivered by this, uh, this paper is that shared CDR3 motifs may be surrogates for shared antigen specificity. That, that is based on the observation that um, uh, the shared CDR3 motifs usually have similar structures that can allow them to recognize the same antigens. They use the most uh, very famous uh, influenza specific TCRs um, that recognize the GIL peptide from the M1, um, the matrix protein of the flu. So they, uh, they argue that uh, the consensus RSS or RSA motif in the, in the middle of the CDR3 beta can uh, form a very specific interaction between the, the antigen peptide and the MGC complex. So uh, basically any CDR3 with a, with a certain lens, in this case it's 13 amino acid, and the harboring this RSS motif somewhere in the middle, they can basically recognize this, uh, this peptide. Um, and indeed, in this case, it, it really works perfectly. But we did, a, okay. so we did a little bit of more benchmarking of the Glyph method. We used the 2000 TCRs that are specific to um, 15 different antigens. So the antigens come from um, uh, different diverse human viruses uh, so mostly uh, like HIV or HCV or CMV. Um, and um, these TCRs, one TCR is only specific to one antigen in this training data. So we applied Glyph onto the 2000 TCRs. The expectation is that different, so TCRs specific to different antigens will be, um, uh, will be assigned to different clusters. So if they are assigned to the same cluster, that means it's a non-specificity and you will observe something like this. So basically something uh, off the diagonal of this confusion matrix. So this matrix along the diagonal measures the TCRs that are correctly uh, assigned to the same group because they are specific to the same antigen. But when you see off diagonal signals, that means the non-specificity is generated by glyph. Um, I think it is pretty clear that there's a tremendous amount of off diagonal signals. So I would argue that Glyph may not be that specific considering this small benchmark data set. Uh, and that is not very surprising because Glyph only relies on a small proportion of the CDR3 sequence. You only use a, a small piece of the motif. So uh, given the vast diversity of the TCRs, um, if you analyze Glyph, um, if, you, if you use Glyph to analyze the TCR repertoire data, I think most of the time you will see a lot of uh, non-specificity. Um, but um, uh, the, the, the use of shorter motif actually gives Glyph the advantage of being more sensitive. 
But in our purpose, uh, we believe more higher specificity is more desirable. So we, we actually developed our own algorithm. We call it iSmart, which is short for immunosimilarity measurement. We are um, aligning receptors of T cells. So basically iSmart is, um, has a, a similar approach as, um, as TCR DIST, but it's slightly, it's different parameterized um, and uh, it, is, uh, it is much faster. So basically we use a motif guided uh, pairwise alignment approach to do TCR's uh, sequence alignment. Uh, and we build a connectivity matrix based on the pairwise sharing scores. And then we call the CDR3 clusters based on user, uh, user defined parameters. So as you can appreciate, I think the, the off-diagonal signals um, of uh, iSmart when applying to the same benchmark data set, it's significantly reduced if you compare to Glyph. So uh, we believe that iSmart is more suitable to analyze cancer associated or cancer antigens because uh, as I just mentioned, cancer antigens are just so diverse. So there, there are so many different cancer antigens. If you're not specific enough, it is very challenging to find the real signal. Okay, so now we feel comfortable to uh, apply iSmart to the TCGA data. Um, before, uh, when I was doing my postdoc in, uh, in Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, I developed this uh, trust algorithm, which performs the novel assembly of the unmapped reads from the RNA, tumor RNA sequencing samples. So we extract the unmapped reads and we perform the novel assembly um, to get the partial or full length CDR3 uh, sequences. So we apply trust to um, over 9,000 TCG RNA six samples, and we assembled 1.5 million CDR3s, but a large fraction of them are not complete. So we filtered for 170K complete CDR3 sequences. And we also excluded the, the public TCRs that are also shared with uh, healthy individuals. Um, and we excluded like more than half of these complete CDR3s because they are also found in healthy donors. So we use the, the Emerson 2017 Nature Genetics cohort as the reference for healthy donors. Uh, after excluding the TCRs, uh, public TCRs, we find eventually we find 80,000 non-public CDRs that we believe are enriched for tumor specificity. And finally, we applied iSmart to obtain a final of um, 4.6 thousand antigen specific CDR3 clusters. So this is what the data look like. If you, um, um, if you look at the, the CDR3s that group together, you can clearly see that um, they're pretty long and uh, they are very similar, except for this uh, tryptophan is uh, replaced by a phylalanine. And uh, we know that both are very large and hydrophobic residuals. So they may very likely share the same antigen specificity. And that is consistent with our argument that uh, iSmart clusters are uh, enriched for antigen specific TCR groups. Uh, and you can also appreciate that uh, this, the, the different TCRs, they actually come from very different cancers. For example, this first one comes from a sample uh, with um, uh, a patient with a testicular germ cell cancer. Um, and this uh, second TCR comes from a ovarian cancer patients. So even different gender. Um, so uh, we believe that um, the, the, the fact that uh, such different patients have independently, uh, independently developed the TCR with this high similarity um, and with also with high frequency in their tumor microenvironment because the, the, the fact that you can actually capture those TCRs with the, uh, with the low coverage RNA-seq samples, RNA-seq data, meaning that these TCRs must present a, a significant a fraction of the tumor infiltrating T cells. So this fact means that those two individuals might likely to share some antigens that can, uh, that can be specifically recognized by the CDR3. So those TCRs are not arise by random, but by selection. Okay, so next we are going to use the TCR clusters to identify a novel cancer antigen. Um, and before we do that, we actually looked through all the TCR clusters, all the 4,000 TCR clusters, and we find quite a lot, a few have this interesting enrichment of uh, cancer types. So uh, remember the previously I showed the uh, one cluster with, um, so two CDR3s, uh, one in the, uh, one from uh, testicular germ cell cancer, one from ovarian cancer. And for those two, 
TCR uh, clusters, one, uh, they are both enriched for colorectal cancer and endometrial cancer. So this is even more uh, interesting. And you can see clearly see the, the motif here. So, so naturally we are interested in looking at what are these patients and why, are, why do they have this uh, uh, very enriched response in the, in the colorectal and the endometrial cancer? Do they have some uh, special um, gene expression that induce the consensus selection of these TCRs? So naturally we did a uh, differential gene expression analysis of the patients between the patients who has the, the, the TCRs in those groups and uh, those without. So we find the top expressed genes are HSFX1 uh, among with uh, a number of uh, regulatory RNAs and this gauge 12F. So we're interested in the top target really because it is the top. So HSFX1 I checked online, it is uh, short for heat shock protein F, uh, transcription factor X linked one. So it's a long name, um, but um, I, I really looked it through uh, the literature, it's, uh, it's rarely reported, so no one knows uh, it's, uh, what is a uh, function. Um, but our, here, uh, the function of this protein is not very important. We are focusing on if it is a real cancer-associated antigen that can induce, um, induce an immune response in the endometrial cancer and the colorectal cancers. So you can clearly see that in the clustered, in patients with the clustered TCRs, the HSFX1 expression is much higher than the other patients. Uh, and if you looked across all the TCGA tumors, you can see clearly see that uh, this gene is only expressing in colon, rectal, and uh, endometrial cancers. So the blue uh, boxes uh, mark the, the adjacent normal samples, and uh, you can see that it's it's completely silenced in all the normal uh, samples. So that means uh, this uh, particular, uh, this gene actually is not expressed in the normal sample and only expressed in, uh, uh, in selected cancer types. And that fits the definition of a cancer testis antigen. Indeed, when we check the GTAX data, this gene is expressed in the testis, but it's uh, silenced in all the GTAX uh, somatic tissue as well. So, but it's, it's never been reported before uh, and uh, it's, uh, we don't know its function, but uh, we can do some uh, downstream computational analysis to see if it can induce some uh, immune response. So we, we process the uh, computationally process uh, a protein sequence of HSFX1 uh, and uh, we basically um, predict which region of this peptide can bind to HRA MGC class one alleles using basically using net MGC pan predictor. Um, and uh, interestingly, we find this um, VMF peptide that has uh, extremely strong binding to uh, three uh, HLA alleles that are all very common alleles. So HLA2 and C7, the, 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 it's predicted to be strong binders, uh, a, a strong binder to all of the alleles. And the, interestingly, when we look at the TCGA sample patients who has the um, expression of HSFX1 and the T cell receptors, they all have a matched HLA allele here. So this one has A2, uh, and these patients have uh, C, C7. Um, so interestingly, uh, here we believe that uh, these patients have the capacity to present the selected uh, antigen uh, to, the, to their surface of the cell, which may induce a consensus T cell response. But uh, this is not uh, the, so this is not a validation. Uh, and we want to do a little bit further so we purchased the HLA A2 um, humanized uh, mouse model from Jackson Lab, um, and these animals express the human HLA A2 allele. Uh, and we synthesized the VMF uh, peptide or the control VRF peptide. So uh, this VRF is replacing the methionine on the actually this MCC anchoring position by uh, 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 arginine. So this replacement actually completely abolishes binding to the MGC class one. So we believe that VR, uh, VRF peptide should have no antigen specificity and there should induce no immune response. And uh, indeed, we vaccinated the animal with uh, both peptides and they, um, with day, uh, uh, at day zero and uh, boost the, the uh, immunization at day 14. And in day 18, we harvest the splenocyte and perform the interferon gamma at the spot. And uh, here you can clearly see that the, uh, the animals that vaccinated with the 
VMF peptide has a significantly higher uh, immune response compared to the VRF control group. So this experiment basically means that this VMF peptide can induce the T cell response in vivo. Uh, and it's also a true binder to HLA A2. But this is animal, this is mouse experiment. And um, uh, the human peptide here is uh, <laughs> considered a novel antigen is not surprised. Um, so we really need the human subjects to perform this experiment. And this is underway. We, we, we don't, we, um, we're still collecting um, patient blood samples to do this. Um, but in, the, in this process, we actually have collected 20 high-grade endometrial carci uh, adenocarcinoma patient samples, and we stained these tissues with the HSFX1 high spe highly specific antibodies. And we find that uh, in 30% uh, in of these patients, this HSFX1 are highly expressed in the tumor, while silenced in the uh, adjacent normal, uh, normal endometrium. So this basically confirms our observation that HSFX1 can be a cancer-specific um, antigen, both at the RNA level and at the protein level, it's, uh, it's highly specific. So it has, it has the potential to serve as a, a novel, maybe cancer vaccine target in the, in the future. So this concludes, uh, this is the second part. Um, and uh, now I hope that I have convinced you that uh, using the clustering method, we can actually identify TCRs that are, that are enriched for cancer associated TCRs. So we really cannot see that every one of them are cancer specific. That is a very ambitious argument. Um, but we can, we can, I think we feel we are comfortable to, to say that these TCRs are at least enriched to the cancer associated TCR uh, repertoire compared to unselected, um, just uh, uh, random TCRs. So now we are, I think we are ready for the development of a novel machine learning algorithm. Um, but before talking about the machine learning, we really want to do some sanity check. So the, by sanity checking, I mean, I want to check if the TCRs we find from the TCGA, the tumor infiltrating T cells, we, we, uh, we assembled from the RNA-seq data, uh, can we find these TCRs in cancer patients, in independent cohorts of cancer patients? So we used uh, this cohort that published by uh, Robert. Uh, I think this is uh, using the early batches of adaptive uh, uh, sequencing. So they sequenced 21 TCR6 samples for melanoma patients. Um, and uh, they, these patients have both uh, uh, pre and post anti-CTLA4 treatment, but that's really not the uh, concern here. We are only focusing on their, so all these samples are blood samples. So we look at the blood TCRs from the melanoma patient samples, and we see, uh, we checked if they are identical. So if they're identical to some of the TCRs we got from the TCGA. And uh, we calculate the frequency of those over, overlapping TCRs. And we compared with the control sample, which are the healthy individuals. So when we do this analysis, we find that the melanoma patients have a significantly higher fraction of uh, cancer associated TCRs compared to the healthy control. Uh, and this is, this is really encouraging because that basically means these T cell receptors we find from the tumor microenvironment of human, uh, human bulk tissue, they can be reproduced. They can be reproducibly seen in, the, uh, in um, other cancer patients, even in the blood samples, you can actually see them. So if you, uh, when we push really hard to the, uh, to the prediction, we want to use this uh, simple measurement of count of reads as a predictor. Uh, it reached 81% of uh, AUC. So it's, it's not great. I mean, this is, this is something expected because we didn't apply any machine learning. This simply just counting how many TCRs we can see in those melanoma patients. And uh, we already see some separation power. Um, but late stage melanoma is uh, kind of uh, uh, boring because no one needs to predict that. It's, it's very obvious. Uh, so we, we next checked if it's possible to detect such TCRs even in early stage cancers. And uh, to our surprise, even though the signal is, uh, is much less significant, still we can see a separation. Well, not really a separation, but really a difference between the, the breast cancer patients and uh, the, the control. So of course, One, the predict. Sorry, you have two minutes left. Yeah, I have two minutes. 
Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, so this uh, sensitivity is uh, pretty low. So that's motivated us to develop this deep learning algorithm that we use the cancer associated TCR and non cancer TCR from the donors. We train the deep convolution neural network as classifiers uh, and uh, which can give us the prediction of cancer scores. So I, I'm not jumping to the details of the, of the uh, neural network uh, model. They're all published. Um, anyone who's interested can check out that. Um, but we did independent validation of DeepCat that um, to predict uh, the T cells that are titromer sorted from the, uh, the titromer sorted antigen specific TCRs. So as you can see that um, uh, DeepCat can differentiate the antigen, cancer associated antigen specific from the influenza specific TCR. Um, with some power, not great power, but uh, this is for single T cell receptors. When we pull a lot of single T cell receptor, uh, pull the T single TCR uh, in the in the repertoire, we actually have uh, hundreds of uh, um, even thousands of TCRs that are uh, deliver some signal. So that's that's when we uh, get observe a really big. Power. So we average the cancer probability of each CDR3, and we define that as a cancer score. As you can clearly see that the can uh, healthy individuals uh, uh, along this area, they have very low uh, cancer score, but all the cancer patients and the tumor infiltrating T cells uh, samples have a, a significantly higher cancer score. So the prediction accuracy of cancer score is uh, very high for melanoma, early stage breast cancer, but can be poor for lung cancer and uh, GBM. So far, we don't know the precise reasons yet, and uh, we also use the independent cohort to predict, uh, to, to validate cancer score. We use the early stage uh, uh, kidney cancer and uh, ovarian cancer, uh, also pancreatic cancer from UT Southwestern, so, and also early stage lung cancers. As you can clearly see that the cancer scores are almost uh, always higher in those cancer patients compared to the healthy donors um, we also collected additionally. So this means that this novel cancer score might be used as an additional diagnostic modality uh, for non-invasive uh, detection of multiple cancers at early stage. So to summary, we developed uh, iSmart that can group TCRs into antigen-specific clusters. We predict a novel cancer-associated antigen. Uh, and uh, use that, we developed this deep cat algorithm to predict, um, uh, sorry, to predict the um, cancer-associated TCR repertoire. And finally, uh, our cancer score can separate cancer patients from early, uh, early stage cancer patients from healthy individuals with really high accuracy. Um, uh, with that, I would like to thank my lab members who contribute to this work, and also my close collaborator, Dr. Yang Xinfu, who helped with a lot of our uh, sample um, experiments, and also our collaborators who contribute our samples and help with the independent validation. Uh, and thanks, I'm ready for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, so there's many questions. Uh, so we will keep on time. Uh, we'll see how many we can handle. Um, mm -hmm. The first question uh, so is from Niklas uh, Schwab. Uh, he's asking, why do you assume that TCRs detecting neoantigens cannot be present in healthy individuals at all? They might be extremely low expressed, but uh, as they should not, there should be no post thymic modification? Uh, should, shouldn't they be present uh, in this patient before developing cancer and therefore in at that time uh, individuals, healthy individuals? Uh, that's a great question. So we actually thought about this. So that's why when we analyzed the, uh, when we calculated the cancer scores, we excluded the low frequency T cells. So we only include the top most frequent T cells. Um, and we, we believe that with this, we have uh, effectively excluded the naive T cells, which has not been exposed to the antigens. And indeed, when we look at the naive T cell repertoire, their cancer scores are actually higher. So that actually is, a, is a, you know, in line with uh, Nicholas' uh, question, his expectations, yeah. So following question is, uh, can iSmart also be used for B cell? Yes. We actually use that to uh, study a, a cohort of um, uh, COVID-19 patients in our uh, in-house uh, data. And uh, it works similarly. So it actually is faster. You can, uh, you can use iSmart. We have an even a faster version we call iSmart F, uh, which is you can find it in our GitHub um, uh, website that um, it's, uh, it can perform a multi repertoire clustering. Uh, so we are working towards the next generation of iSmart. 
that is capable to align um, uh, tens of millions of TCRs uh, or BCRs. Yeah. Okay, so so that was a following question uh, to to have an idea on how does the um, iSmart scale to large repertoires, uh, mm -hmm. and in fact, Sebastian was uh, asking whether you can give an estimate of the speed of the algorithm, uh, so like uh, hundreds of thousands CDR three sequences. Hundreds of thousands is quite easy for us right now. We can do that within one minute. Yeah, uh, we are now approaching to do 20 million TCRs, and that's a little bit challenging. It takes us um, it takes us um, three to four days to process. Yeah. Okay. There was also a question because uh, you you did the comparison between iSmart and Glyph. Mm -hmm. uh, so one question was whether you evaluate um, both uh, well iSmart using the same test um, that you gave to Glyph. Yes, we are using the same, yeah, same data set, yeah. Um, there is a question from Alexander Brown. So mm -hmm. he's asking, he's uh, asking, yes, rather than using an MHC prediction approach, have you considered using a combinatorial mutational scanning peptide library to identify the specific peptide which the TCR recognizes? That is that will be an interesting experiment. Yeah, we we currently do not have the capacity to perform that experiment. We are a computational lab, but that's a fantastic idea. I think with our predictions and uh, with the with the pooled peptide design, I think that will be very helpful. Yeah. So the, the following comment was that this would also allow you to better identify if there is a cancer uh, new antigen which is uh, present, which might be which might miss. Uh, in the pure MHC predictive. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm just looking at the time, so we still have one minute. Uh, another question from Anne Uchter. Uh, she is asking, how was the specificity of your test PCRs used in iSmart determined? So the the the, the TCR uh, that you that you use for uh, iSmart and that where come that came from. Um, that that use in iSmart, did you uh, where the how the specificity was initially determined? How did you know that uh, this given TCR was actually really specific of uh, this given? Uh... Uh, that was actually using the benchmark data that are uh, you know the fifteen uh, antigens. Uh, it's two thousand TCR specific to fifteen antigens. Uh, we calculated the off diagonal, basically the misclassified TCRs divided by the total, uh, and we got the uh, estimation of uh, specificity about 93%. So basically that means along the diagonal cons cons constitute of 93% of the data. Okay. So I think we are on time. <laughs> okay. Uh, so there's uh, two additional questions. So please look at the Q&A and, and, and answer to uh, Uda who had uh, the question. Okay, Thank you sure. Thank very much for your great talk, and we are moving on to the next speaker. Thanks a lot.